No, I was first. Yeah, I don't. How did you do? Okay, I don't know. I, don't know. I, I feel like it's saying that. It's like we like we get to recover my mind. Go ahead and get started. Can you hear me okay in the back? Awesome. How are we doing? Good. Hope y'all had a fabulous spring break. Welcome to a celebration of literature and writers. I'm Megan Marshall. I'm the director of the QC Hyde series. And tonight we have an author here who has been described as the most fearless writer in America. And I mean, as we can see too from the turnout, I think we're very excited to have her here with us. Um, but before I invite her officially up to the podium, I do wanna thank those folks who have helped to make this series and this event possible. That includes all of our friends at Love Library. I have Marco Tumlin, my esteemed co-host, holding it down in the back. I don't, yeah, let's get Marco in the back. Um, I also wanna thank Donnie Muka Hall, Laura Bliss, and Rebecca Williamson. I also need to thank the Department of English and Comparative Literature and Instructionally Related Activities for their support of this event. And tonight I want to give a very special thank you to Dr. William Nariccio and uh, the master. Yeah, he's kind of popular. <laughs> and the uh, Master of Arts and Liberal Arts, excuse me, Master of Arts and Liberal Arts and Sciences program for their generous contribution. Um, lastly, I'm uh, very honored to acknowledge the space that we are privileged to share this evening. For millennia, the Kumeyaay people have been a part of this land. This land has nourished, healed, protected, and embraced them for many generations. And as members of the SDSU community, we acknowledge their legacy. And just a few final reminders, if you have yet to do so, please silence your cell phones. And uh, know this event is being recorded, but don't worry, all you see is this square here. All right, without further ado, it's my pleasure and honor to introduce our featured reader. Miriam Gerba is a writer, artist, and activist. Her first book, the short story collection, Dahlia Season, won the Edmund White Award for debut fiction. Oh, the Oprah Magazine ranked her true crime, crime memoir, Mean, as one of the best LGBTQ books of all time. Creep, her most recent book, which is also on sale over there in the corner, is a finalist for a National Book Critics Circle Award in criticism. The New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Harper's Bazaar, Vox, and Paris Review have published her fine work. She is co-founder of Dignidad and Terraria, a grassroots organization committed to combat combating racism in the book world. She is also active in the anti-rape movement. Miriam's work has been lauded as profoundly insightful, thoroughly researched, incredibly invented, and laugh out loud funny, brave, tender, and beautifully daring, which are all accurate and very well-earned descriptions. But what I find to be most essential about Miriam's work, aside from its sharp prose, rich imagery, and neck, for occupying the delicate space between humor and horror is that unlike what she might aptly label as fake ass social justice literature, she doesn't claim to speak for the silent. Instead, she interrogates and tears down the structures, systems, creeps who have committed or enabled, enabled this silencing, which in turn works to amplify and to embolden those necessary voices. Additionally, her work off the page as an activist and ally goes beyond the book blurb. It shows us what true literary citizenship or just citizenship should look like. She's not just earned a seat at the proverbial table, she's cleared space for others to join. And or perhaps even better, she's given them fuel to set that table on fire. So for all she's done both on and off the page, please join me in giving a warm, warm welcome to Miriam Gerba. Thank you for that beautiful introduction. Can you hear me in the back? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, I'm going to be reading from Crete. And um, for those who are unfamiliar with the book, it is an essay collection. Um, most of the pieces are cultural criticism. 
There is also literary criticism and um, both of those are mixed with personal narrative. I'm going to be reading from the essay Kukui. Uh, if you have the book and you're really nerdy and you want to follow along, um, turn to page 29. That's where Kukui begins. And for those who are unfamiliar with that word, it sort of approximates boogeyman. Um, and the inspiration for the Kukui essay <laughs> came in some ways from Donald Trump. Um, <laughs> I don't know if anybody here remembers when he was using the phrase bad hombres. <laughs> So I had that phrase um, sort of stuck uh, in my mind and I wanted to write about the phenomena of the bad ombre. And so I assembled um, several of these figures and wrote about how they each relate to one another and relate to me. Um, and the primary bad hombre in this essay is Richard Ramirez, AKA the Night Stalker. Raise your hand if you have some familiarity. I'm just curious. Okay, everybody here. <laughs> um, but the essay opens with the introduction to a different um, complicated figure. And it opens in my classroom. I taught high school for about um, 13 years. So this opens in my classroom. I'll go ahead and begin, Kukui. I used to introduce a certain civics lesson with a mugshot. The last time I taught the class, I projected this sad photo onto a screen mounted at the front of my classroom. A tired Mexican, his upper lip lightly shadowed, gazed upon us. Leaving my podium, I approached the screen pointing at the mugshot with my yardstick. And I want to do this because I feel like I'm back in my room, like <laughs> pointing. Check it out, I said. This picture was taken by Phoenix police in 1963. You can see the guy's booking number on the sign he's holding up. We're going to talk to our neighbors for a moment about who we think this man is. And we've got a little while to discuss the following questions. Why was this mugshot taken? What did this guy do to become famous? A football player growled, give us a clue, Gerba. <laughs> okay, I bet you already know this guy's name. There's a speech named after him that I bet a lot of you have memorized. My high schoolers, especially those who looked like the tired Mexican, took their instructions seriously. I roamed, listening to them improvise his identity, history, and significance. Shy boys huddled, discussing the possibility that the guy in the mugshot had immigration related problems. A few steps away, girls vigorously argued. One faction believed that the tired Mexican was caught driving without car insurance. Another faction believed that he'd hit an old lady with his car. Turning to a girl with braids, a girl with braces said, I think he got busted stealing food to feed his family. Aw, said the girl with braids, that's so sweet. I vote for stealing food. <laughs> I love kids. Like, <laughs> the best people. <laughs> Once five minutes had passed, I announced, we have some time to talk as a whole class now. Anyone who wants to can share who they think this man is, why he's famous, and why the cops took his picture. Since it wasn't every day that a Mexican appeared in our curriculum, the kids were itching to connect with the man in the mug shot. One boy shouted, it's my Uncle Edgar. Another yelled, no way, that's my cousin Hector. Other students compared the mug shot to friends and classmates, pointing out similarities between eyes, noses, lips, hair, and ears. A boy named Freddie blurted, that nerd was late returning books to the library. Everyone laughed. How come you think that, I asked. Because that fool looks like Kevin Ortega. I tried not to laugh. The mugshot did resemble Kevin Ortega, a nerd I'd be teaching next period. <laughs> 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 
Once every kid who wanted to speak had gotten their turn, I said, all of your theories were interesting to hear. Now I'll tell you who this guy is and what he got accused of. This guy's name is Ernesto Miranda. He didn't get in trouble for jaywalking or stealing milk or running people over with his car or for keeping his library books too long. In 1963, Ernesto Miranda was charged with kidnapping and rape. Kids gasped. That guy raped? Yup. But he looks normal. I said, I agree. Perfectly normal. So normal, in fact, that he looks like many people we know. Everyone was sitting up straight. You guys want to hear the story of what happened to him? Yes. Okay. It's March 1963. The setting is Phoenix, Arizona. Think cacti, lizards, sand, tumbleweeds, an unforgiving sun. Have any of us been to Arizona? A girl waved and shouted, Yuma, I've been to Yuma. I said, excellent. That's near where Cesar Chavez died. So <laughs> detectives knock at the front door of the home of Ernesto Miranda, a dock worker who loads fruits and vegetables by night. Holding their baby, Ernesto's common-law wife, Twyla, answers the door and, wait, what, screamed a girl? This motherfucker has a child? And a wife? I thought you said he was a rapist. I said that he was charged with rape. And why wouldn't a rapist have a wife? In a tone suggesting that he was stating the obvious, a short boy answered, Miss Gerba, if a guy has a wife, he should not to rape nobody. Let that sink in. I took a deep breath, pointed to the mugshot and said, this is what a rapist can look like. They are normal everyday people. And we've probably had moments in our lives when we have associated with rapists and didn't know it. You know, no one walks around saying, nice to meet you, I'm a rapist. Wanna hang out? <laughs> and rape has nothing to do with the husband or anyone else not getting enough sex, do you hear me? Instead, rape has to do with geography, with putting a victim in her place and making her stay there. Got it? Most of the girls in class nodded. Returning to our story, I told everyone that detectives took Ernesto to a police station where he was handed a numbered placard and ordered to stand in a lineup with three other men. A two-way mirror reflected their unsmiling faces. On its other side stood a nervous 18-year-old girl. She had reported to police that during her walk home from work, a Mexican man wearing glasses and a white t-shirt had kidnapped her. After tying her up, he drove her to the desert and did her dirty. Only one man in the lineup, Ernesto, wore glasses and a white t-shirt. Still, the girl wasn't sure that he was her attacker. Cops marched Ernesto to an interrogation room. They sat him down and they lied to him, telling him that he was in big trouble. Several women had positively identified him as their attacker. A detective handed Ernesto a copy of a standard statement form. Ernesto scrawled his name on it. In the spaces provided for age and education level, he wrote, 23 and eighth grade. He filled the rest of the page with a plain yet anatomically graphic confession that ended with him driving his victim home. His last words to her were, pray for me. Girls gasped. The nerve, one shouted. I know, I shouted back. The confession led to Ernesto's conviction and a judge sentencing him to 20 to 30 years on each count. Ernesto's lawyers appealed his case and Miranda versus Arizona was eventually argued before the Supreme Court. The question before the justices was this, can the confession of someone like Ernesto, a modestly educated poor person who doesn't know that they're entitled to have a lawyer help them with the police, be admitted into evidence? The Supreme Court's answer to this question was no. 
Ernesto had been coerced, cheated out of specific protections. Had he known about the Fifth Amendment, the law that gives us the freedom to keep our mouths shut when cops try to make us say what they want to hear, Ernesto might have kept the knowledge of his dirty deeds to himself. Had someone told Ernesto about the Sixth Amendment, the law that's supposed to guarantee us access to an attorney, he might have gotten decent representation, a lawyer who could have advised him to save his confessions for church. The lunch bell was set to ring in a few minutes. I scooped a small stack of papers off the table and walked from group to group, distributing them. I said, next time we meet, I'll finish telling you the story of Ernesto Miranda. And I'm passing out the little speech I was telling you about. It's called the Miranda warning. Like I said, you probably have it memorized. If you don't, practice it. Read it to the mirror. Read it to your dog. Read it to your mom. Mirandize your grandma if you have to. <laughs> I'm gonna ask someone to recite the Miranda warning next class. That'll be your quiz. I can recite it right now, Freddie yelled. He made a fist and thumped his chest. <laughs> I swear this kid was like. <laughs> He was funny. He was always like, I love this class. I was like, okay. <laughs> the bell rang. I appreciate your enthusiasm, Freddie. Maybe next time. Most kids scooped up their backpacks, purses, or bags and shuffled out of the room. A few stayed. Two Mexican girls sat in the corner by the thermostat, eating sandwiches and mumbling, you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. It was so cute to watch them like <laughs> arandizing each other over sandwiches. <laughs> <laughs> Two other Mexican kids, Paul and Daniela, sat at the table by the radiator. A plastic bag filled with baby carrots rested between them. They took turns fishing nubs out and dunking them into a small plastic container of ranch dressing. We're all familiar with these public school carrots, right? Okay. Watching them was making me hungry. Can I have a carrot? I asked Daniela. Did you forget your lunch again, Miss Gerba? Maybe. She laughed and said, I like this class. Paul said, so do I. What do you like about it? I asked. Paul said, I don't know, it's chill. Daniela said, I like learning about crime. <laughs> the only other class where we learn about crime is forensic science. What do you do in forensic science? Beaming the way sports fans do when asked about their favorite team, Daniela answered, oh my God, we had a unit on serial killers. It was so fun. We got to pick our favorite and do a presentation on him. My favorites are Jeffrey Dahmer and Richard Ramirez. Hey, I like Richard Ramirez too, said Paul. Daniela asked, who's your favorite serial killer, Miss Gerba? <laughs> my mouth went dry my palms began to sweat I sat on my hands in a small voice I answered I don't have one really really why not rather than explain that I had my own Richard Ramirez I said I just don't Daniela shrugged and ate another carrot I'll stop there um, should I do some more? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> um, I'll go ahead and stop with that essay there because it kind of winds in and out of time. So it's kind of difficult to um, follow, but I can go ahead and read from, let me find the other one that I read from sometimes. Let's do a little bit of... Locas. So I'll read the first couple of pages of Locas. That begins on page 54. And I'll do the first three pages of that one. And Locas is a very different essay from the others in the collection because all of the others in the collection, with the exception of the Pendeja essay, <laughs> um, <laughs> all of the others were ideas that were. Uh, Mine, they were my original ideas, but this essay was not my original idea. This is the only essay commissioned by a family member. So at the beginning of the pandemic, my prima uh, Desi called me and uh, expressed to me that she was really disappointed 
with um, the way that she exists in the Criminal Legal Archive of California. And she's uh, very disappointed with the way crime reporters have written about her. There's the story of the crimes that she perpetrated, but uh, what is missing is the story of how she became a gangster. And so she asked me to tell that story. And when we were kids, we had our own gang and I never got jumped out. So whenever my cousin tells me to do something, I do it. <laughs> and we're not taking no members. <laughs> I just I put that out there. Okay, I'll read the first three of Locas. My cousin Desiree and I never played house. Pretending to be a mom who hits her kids with anything in reach or a dad who forgets to pay his child support didn't interest us. Instead, we played at being female gangsters, cholas, young women with big hairdos and tattooed hands that could apply eyeliner as deftly as they could aim a shotgun at an enemy's head. Our gang had two members, us, and we planned on recruiting no one else, not our siblings, not our parents, definitely not our grandma. We called ourselves pocas pero locas. <laughs> I came up with the name. <laughs> and we practiced throwing gang signs, curling our small fingers into PPL. Desiree and I were 14 and 13 when we created our two girl crime family. We needed this little organization badly. There were things Desiree couldn't tell her parents and there were things I couldn't tell mine. Turning away from grown-ups, we created a tiny Cosa Nostra for protection, affection, and fun. Pledging our allegiance to PPL, we helped each other to carry our burdens as best as we could. Committed to what we've built, Desiree and I remain as loyal to our childhood enterprise as the Pope is to gold. <laughs> the, day, the day Desiree appointed me to tell her story, I started sketching it in my head. I knew it would begin with our hands. Hands are what we use to beautify ourselves. Hands are what we use to turn the volume up on the radio. Hands are what we use to commit facts to paper. Hands are what we use to caress lovers, fold letters, poke holes, and kill. My hands will show you why two California girls dreamt up a make-believe mafia and why one of us gravitated to a real one. My hands have permission to describe the romance and seduction of hustling. My hands will demonstrate that my cousin is living proof of the high cost some girls are expected to pay for surviving the United States of America, the country with the world's highest incarceration rate. Crime reporters have covered bleak moments in Desiree's life. What they've written about her is true, but recklessly incomplete. Published by the San Gabriel Valley Tribune, one of their articles begins, police arrested four people this Thursday for using fraudulent gift cards to make hundreds of dollars worth of purchases at Walmart. Desiree was this group's only woman. At age 36, she was also its oldest member and its only wanted parolee. Before the reporter reveals that my cousin surrendered without a fight, he raises the stakes, writing that two loaded handguns were recovered from inside the suspect's car. The San Gabriel Valley Tribune names no eyewitnesses. None of the arrested are heard from either. The only person quoted by the newspaper is Glendora Police Lieutenant Rob Lamborghini. He, <laughs> what a name. He, <laughs> he likely fed every detail about my cousin's supposed activities to the reporter and the article's tone is sympathetic to Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> As if the U.S. multinational corporation were a helpless woman whose purse was nearly snatched by four degenerates. If you ask me, we should all rob Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> there are a million reasons why. Here's one. In 2003, lawyers working on behalf of the company paid a $52,000 bribe to Mexican officials. This money bought them permission to build a store 
one mile from Teotihuacan's pyramids and construction workers broke ground in an alfalfa field, digging and digging, churning soil. A crew of archeologists overseeing the project soon unearthed evidence that Walmart was messing with ancient ruins. Along with a 700 year old wall and altar, the company also disturbed nine graves. Fuck Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> When, thank you. <laughs> when fans of law and order hear the word criminal, I doubt that Walmart comes to mind. Instead, the people Rob Lamborghini gets paid to talk about do. Most police departments staff someone like him, a representative whose job it is to speak to reporters about how cops keep us safe, a spokesman who convinces taxpayers that the police are here to catch bad guys. Bad guys like my cousin. At her mother's ramshackle house in Riverside is a box filled with Desiree's faded school assignments. The first is dated January 8th, 1980. On its slightly rumpled paper appear two red handprints. Beneath these hands, which look like a child's bloody palm prints pressed against a foggy window pane, someone, probably the teacher, neatly wrote, finger painting is fun. A slightly smeared family portrait drawn in primary colors is dated six days later. A large blue circle with wide eyes and a big mouth dominates the center. <laughs> Under this face, in an adult's crisp penmanship, the words, this is my grandma. To the right floats a small blue circle, its mouth open in a scream. Worried eyes glance back at grandma. Beneath it, in the same adult's crisp penmanship, this is my mommy. To the right of these faces, a faceless yet ferocious red scribble. This is my daddy. Desiree's own writing appears in pencil against a line sheet of paper dated April 18th, 1983. Over the top of the sheet peaks a self-portrait drawn in crayon a smiling face with green eyes framed by brown hair. Underneath its chin, the words, when I grow up, I will be a teacher because I want to help children do work and read. My cousin has no recollection of writing this. She can't imagine her seven-year-old self at a classroom desk dreaming about a cheerful future. Instead, she remembers things she was supposed to keep secret things that we're now going to set free. We just need another hand for me. Um, again, copies of Creep are, or do we still have copies available? All right, yes, are available for purchase over there if you'd like to grab one. Um, we're going to linger a little bit in the room for Miriam to do some book signings if you want to get your book signed. On about 10 or so minutes, we're going to convene across the hallway in room 408 for a Q&A session with Miriam. So if anybody would like to join me and my class, you are welcome to do so. Uh, if not, thank you so much for being a wonderful audience. And please join us on Zoom next week for poet Joshua Burton. Thanks, y'all. I'm going to try to get it.